We'll go ahead and call the meeting to order. Um, Matthew, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Thank you. Okay, very good. The first order of business will be roll call. Tammy Bay. Here. Uh, Nicole Shapu. I'm here. Joseph Dugan. Here. Paul Driven. Here. John Peppers. Here. Mm -hmm. Jennifer Finney. Here. Matthew Heil. Here. Melissa Johnson. Dean Kirkton. Here. Kyle Clemp here. And Michael Yoko. Here. Thank you. Thank you. The next order of business is approval of the minutes. Are there, they've been distributed. Are there any additions or corrections? So I had a question about um, on, under the future meeting dates, um, when we remove the April 3rd meeting, um, I believe it was a motion by Tammy and a second by Jennifer, and it was adopted unanimously. I can add that. Okay, thank you. thank you. And then the motion to adjourn, um, was it you, Tammy? Or I think so. Tammy made the motion to adjourn, and John, did you second that? Yes. Okay. Oh. Do we have a motion to approve the minutes as amended? So moved. Okay. Second. I second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Very good. They're adopted. Um, public comment. Nobody here is anybody online. I don't see any okay. hands up and no, no cards. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, I had uh, comments from two people that said they would be here, but I guess they're not going to make it. So, next item of business will be governance. And the last time we talked about um, moving member discussion and questions up on the agenda. Is there any discussion on that? Are you talking about to formally adopt that, or do we have any member discussion? Um, well, we can, um, I don't know that we need to, Neil, do we need to make a motion to switch the order of our agenda? So you'd be amending the agenda, traditionally we would do that, so we would need to amend the agenda. <laughs> someone would move to amend the agenda in any way that you're describing now, then secondly, the other way. Okay. I felt, did we not do that at the last meeting? No, oh. we just brought it up as discussion. Is there a motion to move the agenda? Oh, I'll make a motion to move the, um, which are called, right, the member discussion and questions portion of the agenda up um, to fifth on the agenda, or is, are we doing it that way, or as part of the governance section? Governance. governance. As, okay, as part of the governance section. Okay. Is there a second? Second. <laughs> okay. So any discussion? Just what, one question, Madam Chair. Would would that preclude us from revisiting I mean, member discussion at the end of the meeting if there's time? No. It would not. Okay. okay. And last time, I think, Joe, did you mention time limits? I did raise that question, yes. Good. <laughs> um, I, I was thinking more, well, again, it could be either done in terms of, you know, member comments uh, or public comments, but, you know, I, I think you'd have to be consistent with the two. It's just something to be thinking about. Um, so do we want to, um, my, my way I operate is more informal as long as we're moving along efficiently. Do we want to be encumbered by rules or just play it by ear and see how things work? So. I think they're more casual. Okay. All right. Anybody else? I struggle with any the rules here are to help mm -hmm. when you can't otherwise move forward, but as you've indicated, if you're moving forward, you're moving forward efficiently and don't get don't get bogged down in 
That's the way I roll. Okay. All right. Do we call for the vote? Is there a unanimous consent or anybody opposed? Okay, the motion carries. Um, next item business is new business and um, we'll begin discussing the charter at um, section 10, article 10. So the first section is 10.1 powers and duties and um, staff recommended eliminating and addressing, addressing by ordinance and, and if the article remains to define the role of the city council. Does anybody have any talk on that? I was considering all of this and, you know, thinking again, bigger picture, how are we doing this? Because we have so much stuff and I don't have a good sense for what ways we could group things, but I was wondering how much, you know, we should either be looking at a whole new thing or can we make a statement, <laughs> remove all department references, they will all be done by ordinance or something and like, you know. Yeah, and I think that um, Neil and down the agenda is going to talk to us about how we go about that um madam chair i guess just point of clarification at least if we're talking about article 10 we're talking about boards and commissions as right. opposed to right. departments yeah so right. i mean there are, there are two separate issues yeah i, I worded it wrong yeah. same concept yes yeah. thank you um i guess my question is in, in um article 4.3 it talks about boards that we have in there already that and if they're not they're established by ordinance so to me 10.1 seems like it's redundant and maybe it could be removed unless i'm missing something madam chair yes <clears throat> so i i mean i don't know if legal counsel can give us any history here as Article 10 versus the prior mention. Uh, it seems like Article 10 is a an umbrella for at least three boards or commissions. Um, but there are other commissions and boards that are elsewhere, like the planning commission, and maybe there's others. Um, do, do we have any sense of why the, is this just by happenstance that this has happened over time? I do. So if you again. We're a charter city, we all know that we're given certain powers and authorities that are granted to us by the state legislature that say, we have all the powers that the legislature has. So what you're doing here is constructing a framework. And basically what you're doing is you're establishing the fact that council has the ability to establish boards and commissions, whatever those might be, they can be left to ordinance. You don't have to put them necessarily here, but I do think you wanna state that the power exists. Now, I think it does impliedly, but again, what you're doing here is creating a constitution, for lack of a better word. It is from this document that all power in the city ultimately arises. The grant of the charter and then ultimately the charter itself, right? So I think having language in there that says you have the ability to create these things is very, very important because you always want to be able to say whatever we've done here has been done according to the powers granted to us by the state legislature under the charter. So this first paragraph, all boards and commissions shall have such powers and perform such duties as are prescribed by law or by this charter, and if not so prescribed, then such may be prescribed by ordinance. Bingo. There you go. And again, the next section, each board and commission may establish such rules of procedure and organization as it deems necessary, not inconsistent with the charter. That's fine, too. So again, there's nothing in here that does anything other than say you've got the power to create these things. Why they elected to create parks and recreation is probably because whomever wrote the charter wanted to be certain that parks and recreation was a board and commission, right? And so by putting it in, in the charter, you eliminated the easy ability to change this. The only way you get rid of parks and recreations at this point is to amend the charter. Now, again, you'll never get rid of parks and recreation, but I think that's probably what their thinking was. Um, board of trustees, um, or the police and firemen's retirement fund, that's in there. 
because now we no longer use this, okay? But that's in there because you wanted to make sure that again, that was a protected area since you were investing money and you wanted to make sure that that existed and it didn't exist at the whim of council, it existed because charter said it exists. So again, no longer necessary, that easy, 10.3, take out. But you know, again, whether you take 10.2 out, that's, that's a call that you all make. Um, and if there are any other particular boards or commissions that you think are important, probably want to name them so that they're always and forever in there, at least until the charter gets in. So same would be true with Parks and Rec, planning and zoning. May I do a follow-up? Yeah. Just to what extent do these boards and commissions reflect public engagement and an expression of public engagement that, you know, that the charter is specifying that you know, a board or commission is set up. And to some extent, we're, we're saying that it needs to be comprised of certain types of members. And is that an expression of public engagement? And if we do decide to fiddle with that, is uh, do we have a disconnect here with public engagement? I, I just raised the question kind of in a theoretical sense to think this through. Sorry, I may have answered. Oh, yeah. Public engagement, is, it, it depends on what you're talking about when you talk about it. Okay, so is public engagement encourage, encouragement to the community to participate in the process beyond just serving on the board? You know, again, is it is it the public statement end of things? You know, is it people going out and seeking thoughts of the public? You know, again, that is, I think, an interpretive element. There are some who believe that if you're appointing people who are otherwise qualified members of boards and commissions, you are getting public engagement by doing that. There are others who think that you should go further. But that's a question of interpretation and philosophy as opposed to a legal question. I'd also add that in the council and staff recommendations, the model charter has actual language on public engagement that we've asked you to consider as well to make that very explicit rather than implicit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I was going to say, Joe, whether we thought that putting that language in, it's 7.01 in the model, if that kind of, like, even if we pulled this out, right. putting that back in reinforces the importance. And I have an additional point that um, by only having parks and recreation and uh, the police, whatever that is, you know, it, it, in a certain sense, it's making them seem more important than any other board and commission. And I'm not sure that's anybody's intent. So we could still make sure that the ones that we found to be of primary importance, you know, we could keep it like we have in 4.3, where we state a bunch of them and then say, and whatever other ones the council wants to add. Well, my, my preference, is, and it's consistent with how I view this all along, is just to lay out 10.1 and not specify what boards and commissions need to be in the charter. I agree with that. I thought that in the, both sections, trying to make it the minimal language and not specify was the preferred way, but... Mm -hmm. And the, the staff reasoning for that was, let's see, in 4.3, the, the question in 4.3 was which boards and commissions should be listed in the charter, if any. And I don't remember what we discussed on that point. Well, there's a couple that just don't exist, so it's wrong. And so then if we take it out, then in the future, we don't have to worry about it being wrong as they change, I think was the argument. So I guess we're back to, just to clarify, are we suggesting 10.1 can be eliminated and 4.3 can be updated to current boards that we want to keep in there. Madam Chair, just briefly, Mr. Hyle has his hand up. Okay. 
So um, I went through and looked at all of the places where we where the charter talks about boards and commissions. And it's 4.3, 7, 10, 11, and 11.5. So it's really not in a lot of places. But either putting it in 4.3 or 10.1, I mean, the language in 10.1 seems pretty much all encompassing and straightforward. But we potentially can do 10.1 and get rid of the other subsections in 10 and just yes. go with 10. Mm -hmm. Or do we need 10 at all? Like, could we, if we wanted to keep any of that verbiage, could we tuck it into 4.3? I think you're talking, if, if I may, I think you're talking about perhaps different purposes. So Article 4, which is administrative services, is finance law, public works, police fire. Oh, you're right. You're right. I wasn't separating right. that in my head. Thank so, you. So I think we probably want to keep that. Agree. We you do. probably do want to keep those departments with department heads yep. because you're giving yourself a structure. So uh, in terms of Article 10, I, I think you could take the first couple of paragraphs of Article 10, leave those in, which gives council the ability to create boards and commissions otherwise. And, um, you know, again, you still do need to have in there public works, again, because it's like the administrative end, and of course the Board of Adjustment, because that's the appeal process for planning, uh, planning and zoning. And you wanna keep those separate and, and apart because it just makes sense to do that um, because of the purposes they serve. So I would tell you they probably still need to be in those three spots. 4.3 needs to be there. 10.1 needs to be there, but it can be in a much limited form, much more limited form than what you have now. Um, and, and even what you have now is not particularly onerous. But again, I think just saying, um, I think 10.1 in its short three paragraphs, probably all you need. Um, you could still plug parks and recreations back in if you wanted to under 4.3 um, rather than create its own section, but uh, and I think eliminate 10.3 altogether. It doesn't exist anymore. Okay. Yeah, just a question. D does deletion of 10.2, does that create any issues in terms of how that organization operates? Yeah. It, it could, because you do have some parks that have been dedicated to the city, and as long as parks and recs exist, there is... That's the commission, the difference from the department. The commission in the charter is the commission that we consider the parks and recs commission. Under the oh, I, okay, I see what you're saying. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. So ask me the question again, Joe, I'm sorry. Well, I, again, I think this is getting to it, is whether if we were to or the voters remove section 10.2, uh, excuse me, 10.2, uh, does that create any issues in how well, Parks and Rec operates? You know, I wasn't thinking about that. That is 10.2 is a commission, right? Mm -hmm. And so again, having it there is probably makes sense. Um, Neil, do you mind if I no, jump comment in. here? So Parks and Recreation Commission is described in ordinance as well as in the charter. It refers its rules or its processes and who can be on it to the charter. The council would have to go and insert within the ordinance, here's who's on it, here's what its job is and so forth. Um, and we've been, and I've said repeatedly, we've been working on this boards and commission revision of the ordinance. And we actually have a placeholder in there right now for what happens if the Charter Review Advisory Board decides to take that out? We know we have to go in there and replace it with something. The, the only difference though, if I may, Mayor, is that Please. last paragraph though, it says council shall have the uh, power and authority as maybe now or hereafter or authorized by law to levy special taxes, ordinances duly uh, adopted for the operation of public parks and recreation grounds and facilities. That's different from the commission. So I think that again, what they're trying to accomplish there, it's kind of interesting because it's that's a financial aspect, it's, it's a levy aspect, but they've plugged it in there. And I've sort of glossed over that particular, um, that particular section because I have not 
seen a tax that has been levied. So Madam Mayor and members, just to add briefly to that, uh, there is a parks improvement sales tax uh, that is, and then obviously any bonding specific for the parks, but those are fine statutory authority and charter authority in different places. We haven't had any uh, in my review of the revenues or uh, looking at things that fall under that piece. I, I would imagine that I don't know the status of the parks department at the beginning of this charter uh, in the, the early 50s, but I would imagine that some of those laws did not exist from the state nor the other financing methods that we use today, hence why that was there. Uh, but none of the current revenue streams would be affected, in my opinion, if that line were gone, considering that statutory ability does derive, is given to us to assess those taxes. But that, if, if we were ever going to exercise that authority, I think there would have to be a charter basis for it. Right. We couldn't just do it by means. We have to have a charter provision that says, this is how you do it. If I so, understand, oh, go ahead. Um, if I understand correctly, Missouri has a very unique tax that is, I think it comes from the sales tax, but it goes to our parks and it's kind of a model for the nation because our parks are so well funded. So it could be that this kind of occurred or was somehow maybe, taken into account when Maybe, that I will happened. tell you that um, I haven't considered that. I'm gonna ask you to table this mm -hmm. one, 10.2. Let me look at that and see whether we have any taxes that we've ever authorized um, as, a, as a special tax under this particular section. I'll ask Katie to look at that. Um, but if there is a need to do that, then I would say we probably have to keep this section in as it is. Okay. Let me, let me if you'll table that, I'll take that. Yeah, next we'll table that to the next meeting. And so does that table also this question of liaison? Is that then tied to that or was that the first paragraph? I'm not clear. There was a note about defining the role of the city council liaison. Yeah, I think if we decide that this stays in that we would need to clarify the role of the liaison. So if I may also on that one, the new ordinance or the ordinance that we're proposing for boards and commissions does have a definition of a city council liaison based on other ordinances from other municipalities who have defined that in the past. Okay. Any more discussion on this section? We'll move on to Article 11, Planning and Zoning. Once again, staff recommended eliminating and dressing by ordinance. I, I don't know, Neil, if there are legalities hidden in here that may jump out at us. There are. So again, <laughs> this is <laughs> this is a big one. Yeah. Uh, because again, we want to make sure that it is clear um, in, in terms of what our authority is and how we do it. So you want to have the charter reflecting this. Um, I would tell you that there would be, uh, looking at this, just looking at language change, there, I, I don't see anything that leaps off the page. Uh, the organizational element in section 11.1, uh, I think is pretty clear. 11.2 is also pretty clear. <clears throat> it mirrors statutory authority that we see in, in um, uh, class three and class four cities, um, only because we wanna make sure that we have at least that authority since we are a charter city. Um, 11.2, again, the powers are, are, are pretty much there and the recommendation aspect is there. Subdivision plats are not as important as they once were. This was adopted in 1954. In 1956, there were big changes made to uh, planning and zoning laws that basically made sure that subdivision plats, and by the way, historically, you really want to get some idea, I guess, of where we came from, came from. Look at subdivision plats. Most subdivision plats in Webster Groves provided that we could not sell to people other than white. You mm -hmm. couldn't sell to Jews, you couldn't sell to people of color, you couldn't do any of that sort of thing. And then it had all kinds of provisions about not having body houses and not having glue making factories, things like that. I mean, it really is sort of stunning when you look at these things. And yet these plats still exist and they still govern a lot of what we do. Now, none of that in terms of 
you know, making sure that we can't sell to certain people or that everybody doesn't have access. But um, historically, the subdivision plats have been, they're out there. Now, rarely does a city like Webster Grove see a subdivision plat at this point, but Crestwood has seen the subdivision plat with what they've done now at the old Crestwood Plaza. They eliminated it, they created a plat, they put limitations on it, um, you know, they're there. Again, is it meaningful to us right now? Probably not. But again, is, is that a reason to necessarily take it out? Well, if, if it's not harmful and we can't predict the future, right. maybe we ought to right. leave it alone. So I would, I would tell you, you have to leave it alone. But the other than part of this is Board of Adjustment. You have to have an appeal from the ruling of the Planning and Zoning Commission, and that's what the Board of Adjustment does. So again, it, it's important to note that because I think it is you have to make that power clear because we affect people's use of land. And again, you have to make sure that your authority to do that is clear and unequivocal. And so, um, you know, we, we limit your ability to build certain kinds of projects. We limit your ability to have certain heights. We limit your ability to do all sorts of things. You know, you can't build too close to the property line, that sort of thing. You can get variances on most of these, on many of these things, but again, you have to do it through the process. So I think planning and zoning is an important element. Um, this would be a situation where it might be worth your while to invite our director of planning and zoning up to give a little uh, overview on, on what this does and why we do it so that you guys can have true insight into what's there. And if you all haven't been to a planning and zoning meeting, and it, it's an elaborate process. When people make application for building, uh, they have to submit what it is they're going to do. Staff reviews it. Staff makes recommendations. They bring it to the planning and zoning commission where we have a public hearing. Public hearing then is, you know, again, going to determine whether or not people object to what's going on. And we saw this a lot with Douglas Hill. There was a lot of this process that was going on. Uh, ultimately, planning and zoning only makes a recommendation. Their determinations are not final. Those determinations then go to council and their decisions are then final. So again, because we are limiting the use of land, there is a due process aspect that will attach to these things at all times which says, if we're gonna limit your use of the property that you paid good money for, we wanna make sure that you have a right to a full hearing. So what we've done here is in, in a very broad and general way, establish that. So it might be useful. Um, if you guys wanna review any particular parts of this, it might be helpful to have Mara come and, and, and make a very short presentation to you about what's done and what the procedures are, because it is a due process issue. Neil, I have kind of an academic question. Are you saying, that if these things were enacted by ordinance, word for word, they would have less authority than if it's in the charter? Yes. Why? Because the charter is the power from which the power to create ordinances flow. So if you're establishing it in the charter, saying it's in the charter, it can't be eliminated, it can't be eradicated, it, it is above your ordinance making. And again, ordinances are important, but they don't have the same authority that the charter has. And they can be more easily changed too. Yeah. yeah. So I was looking at this because it was marked by the staff, right? Um, but if Neil's arguing it needs to be here, overall, it doesn't seem very objectionable. The one thing I would point out is it does talk about having to publish two times in a newspaper. And I just question whether that might be getting outdated. Luckily, we still have a local newspaper, but I don't know if that's going <laughs> to stay. But I also don't know if it's worth changing. I just wanted to point it out. You might find some differences of opinion on whether we still have, or whether we want to still have a newspaper, but that's another story. I didn't say we want to, I just said we do. <laughs> um, so the reason we, again, do that is, again, it is it is antiquated. It's an, it's an anachronism. Yeah. You know, the idea, and we publish in two papers of general reading. So one could be Missouri Lawyers Weekly, one could be the St. Louis County, and when was the last time you read either of those? <laughs> I know they existed. You know they exist, right. So again, we do that with publication of our notices for elections and that sort of thing. So it's still done. I mean, I think someday that will change. But before we change it, I would want to see it changed at the, at the level of state legislature, where they would say it would suffice for the purposes of notice to do these things. And the reason I would say that is not because I think there's wisdom in Jefferson City. I don't. It's because, I again, due process is what's at stake here. And unfortunately, they can define due process for us to a certain extent. So again, if they come out and say it's enough to post it on your website, which would make sense, although not everybody has access to it, mm -hmm. right? but it would make sense to at least make that one place where you can publish, 
Um, you know, again, I probably ought to leave that part to Sharon as well. So is there something we're missing from a staff perspective about why it should be updated then? Madam Chair. Yes, so no, I don't believe so. I'm listening to Neil's explanation in terms of having a due process and going through that. I, I don't believe there's anything that we're missing. Any further discussion? So why why would the staff have suggested eliminating it and governing by ordinance? So originally when we were looking at this, and it's been a while, so pardon me, but it the goal was to have all of the departments basically in ordinance since there's so many of the departments that are still listed here that we don't have anymore. Um, or the terminology is pretty outdated. I think we can work around that. However, though, in terms of how members are are looking at this, so I, having heard that explanation, it makes a lot of sense to me to keep that within the charter. And I think the idea here was to look at everything, just mm -hmm. so that we could look at everything. It wasn't just you know create work, but this is this is a big issue. If there's any place that generates litigation, it's planning and zoning. And again, it's it's the sort of thing that's always now we have successfully avoided that over the years, and at least in part because there is a very strong effort to to cooperate with and and not just be heavy handed with the people who live in Webster Groves. And so, if somebody comes in and says, "Look, I, you know, I I want to make a substantial investment um, in, in in my house. I want to do certain things, but I need a variance. It doesn't necessarily fit exactly into this thing." There is a lot of work that's done on those both at the level of planning and zoning, where Mara will get on the phone, will call me, will call Dr. Peoples, will, you know, again, to, to try and talk about what we can do to sort of find some common ground that works. And as a consequence, we really have, a, I've never had, a, and I've been here since, since December of 18, I've never had a piece of litigation that's arisen from what we've done in planning and zoning. And that's not because we're rolling over, it's because we're trying to accommodate, so. Just so you know, that history is important to understand too. So in the model um, charter, there's a lot of language about um, how important it is to make sure that this is inclus an inclusive um, area of the, of the charter for a city. Is there anything in this that needs to be looked at or that could be limited or is that really taken care of in ordinances? Like you said, those subdivision plats sound really awful. Yeah, the subdivision plats is probably the only anachronism in the thing. Um, again, we could we could address subdivision plats, in my opinion, through ordinances, because I think it's subsumed into the general authority that's already defined. Um, but other than that, having read the model code and thinking about what they have recommended, I, I really think I really think that what we have in here is enough and not too much, but for the subdivision plans. So, um, I, I, I no, I would I would give you a strong recommendation that I think it's I think it's good as it is. Uh, Eleven point four be the only question. I might add, just as part of an answer to that question, most of what we think of is as. Um, hindrance to equity in terms of our land use policy is actually in an ordinance. Things like occupancy limits, things like how we zone particular areas of land for different kinds of building types. And it, it, the problems are, we have lots of them in our ordinance, but they're not as here as much. So if you look at the first part in, in, in complementing what the mayor has said, if you look at the first sentence, it says the commission shall hear applications for zoning amendments. So zoning by implication, is an authority that's granted to the city in order to do what needs to be done. So it's the amendments or modifications or revisions that come before the planning commission. So again, if you wanna change your zoning status, that sort of thing, you make those, those determinations. But you, by the authority that's, that's implied, you have the right to create these zoning ordinances and we've done that. Zoning ordinances, if you've ever looked at our ordinances, it's a huge part of the ordinances. Try and read those. <laughs> As a follow up to Tammy's comment, yeah, I, I like the model language. Like they use specific words. They say equitable. They say inclusive. So I think it's good. But I, yeah, I don't know if we want to bother. But I do agree. And I, you know, if I was writing from scratch, I'd put that in there. 
and I have no objection to putting the language in there. So again, implicitly it's supposed to be that way, but it, we all know that that's not how the world necessarily turns. So again, I think the idea of sort of setting a tone is not bad. You can do it probably in a sentence or even less. Um, it certainly doesn't change the spirit of what's going on in terms of the authority, but it might change. It might change the attitude, and that's never. So we could certainly adopt some of that language to include it in there. Well, so I was thinking about this earlier because we we keep trying to look through that lens a little bit through all of the things that we're trying to review, and um, is there a way to? Or is that useful or have other cities done anything where there is maybe a commission or something that, and that's kind of their, what they do when maybe it is, you know, the community at large or however, it's a very broad question, but instead of trying to insert language into each and everything, is there something that can kind of make sure that we um, are kind of hold each other accountable so the easiest way to do it would be to do it in the form of the ordinance because again start with zoning we've got the authority to do that that exists separate and apart from the charter start there and so we include the language about being equitable and making sure that you know we're being fair and all that sort of thing put it there because that's easy to amend and easy to change whereas if we start adding language even though it may not be substantive necessarily Somebody's going to look at it and say, you've got to put that before the voters. And I think ultimately you're going to have to think about the economy of what you're going to put in front of the voters. So again, the language like, again, I, I don't mean to suggest this is unimportant, but the language like equity, inclusion, that sort of thing, that is very, very important language. And perhaps that's the sort of thing you put in the preamble to the charter. But ultimately, ultimately, if you really want to be specific in that regard, do it with the ordinances. I was just going to mention that if we put it in the preamble, that very much states where we stand as a community and should filter down through every other um, section that we have. Kyle, did you say have something? I just, the model charter mentions a couple of times an inclusive, and compre inclusive comprehensive plan. The charter that we have mentions uh, the city's master plan. Are those, am I to understand that that is referring to the same thing? And then when was the last Webster comprehensive plan? We've heard this. <laughs> so the last time was I think that sounds about right. in the 1970s, but in 2015, um, long before anybody who's currently sitting on council was on council, on 2015, they redrew the map, but they never adopted it as a comprehensive plan. I don't know why, but we have, what appears to be a little bit of an inconsistency between the two. So there have been discussions about what we need to do going forward, that sort of thing. But right now, Kyle, we got two different, and they're not necessarily competing, but they are. And in the end, if there was a question about which one had authority, it would be the, the original comprehensive plan, which I think was like 1974. Would it be too prescriptive in the old charter to dictate and using this inclusive comprehensive plan language to mandate a certain two decades that must update comprehensive plan because it's the foundation of the zoning ordinance would be that plan. And if we say that that must be equitable and inclusive and you know considering all these things that might rather than just relying on the preamble for everything. So we'd have to see exactly what the language is, but I think that does run the risk of being too prescriptive. I think that again, the, the, the duty and, and obligation to zone is something that is granted to us impliedly in our general powers. We state that we have the ability to do that, right? What that looks like, how that ultimately is changed and implemented is probably better left to the ordinances than it is to the, code, to the charter. Well, but if that was in the charter, we may not have this issue where we have to rely on this document from the 70s versus the 2015. Perhaps, but again, we still could because again, it's sort of, if you think of it as a work in progress, well, not much progress and not much work, <laughs> but if you, <clears throat> pardon, <laughs> if you think of it as those things, excuse me, they have to have the ability to make those changes. You know, again, under powers and duties, that's where you'd have to put it. And 
I'm just looking to see where it would squeeze in. I also might make a comment that we are talking about a very expensive undertaking when we do it. I mean, yes, you, you know government. So so that I think we ought to bear that in mind as well. Um, the second comment I'll make while Neil's looking around there is um, we do have a city statement of diversity, equity, and inclusion. This has become one of the central values of the developing strategic plan. So I, I don't, you know, again, I, I'd love to see it in the charter. Um, we don't have to have every single thing in the charter, but your point is very well taken about the comprehensive plan. Some of us would really love to do something about that sooner rather than later. I'm not trying to pick up a scab. I just asked the question. No, not, not at all. all. <laughs> not at all. I, and, and frankly, I don't think you're wrong. I, I think you're right. So uh, again, this is a reason why it might be useful to have Mark is I think that the master plan is, is um, expected, anticipated under the zoning powers. And so again, what they're talking about here is the recommendations for modification to the city's master plan um, would ultimately come to uh, would ultimately come to the planning and zoning commission and they would make a recommendation to the council who would do it, okay? And then it can be changed. Now, pardon me, I think the reason that that's there is because they're underscoring the importance of the master plan, but I don't know that you could say much more than that. Al, I, again, the first paragraph says, powers are not limited to the zoning power of the property of persons, corporations. And again, implied in that zoning power is the creation of a master plan. If you come down to the bottom here, further without limiting the powers described above, the plan commission shall have authority to prepare and submit to council. Council approvals such recommendations for modifications as the master plan. So I don't necessarily know why they said that because I think they would have that power anyway, but whoever wrote this wanted to be sure that, that was there. And, and I don't think that hurts anything by having it there. You know, again, wanting to make sure that the planning commission can address this issue, it gives them gives them jurisdiction over the question. So they could, they could, without having the director of planning and zoning come and say, hey, this is what we're doing. They could, on their own, their own authority, say, hey, we're looking to change the master plan. We want to basically give direction to um, Director Perry to start this work. Now, again, I'm Director Perry. I come directly to the council and say, this is going to be a significantly expensive undertaking. I want to prove we do it. But arguably, the charter gives them the authority to do So going back to your question, I don't know that I changed the language, but now that we've diagrammed the sentence, I think we have a better understanding of what the scope of this thing is. I don't know who needs to ask the permission, but I think it would be beneficial to have that presentation. Oh, yeah, we can do that from our, yeah. I, we've mentioned several times of like um, things being uh, outlined in ordinances more in more detail. Um, is what is there a clear process for the public to be able to give feedback or to our ordinances? I don't think we voted on all of them, have we? No. So, do you know, do you know what I mean? So, only so that um, if we're saying that things are going to be dealt with that way, that they can still feel like they get a say in it because we're asking them to vote now. Right. So, so again, it's a philosophical approach, but first and foremost, they get a say in it because who elects council members? So again, if, if council is adopting ordinances, procedures within the ordinances that we don't like, we have the option not to reelect council members. That's number one. Number two, when the ordinances are presented, we, we present them in open meetings. And so we have three readings. We have two readings on the first night. We have a third reading next night. And so there's opportunity to come and be heard because there is also an opportunity for comment uh, at each of these meetings. So we make sure that people know about these things. We put them on the website. Somebody wants to have a, a voice one way or another, they have the ability to come and, and hear. So I do think that there is plenty of opportunity for the public to be heard if they if they choose to do so. What's amazing to me is despite many efforts and, and sometimes the Herculean efforts that people make in order to ensure that the word gets out there, people don't come, people don't show up, and then all of a sudden it's like, how did they have this meeting that we didn't know anything about? Like, uh, that didn't happen. So again, you find yourself, people just don't pay attention. And you know, it's a, it's a never ending battle to try and make sure that people do have the opportunity. 
getting to your question, there is lots of opportunity for public input. Um, you know, these, these ordinances are just signed in the dark of night. We do this in the open and we do, do it with making sure that everybody has as much voice as they possibly can. Thank you. 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 Thank
you could say, I believe it's in the best interest of the city uh, to award this contract as such and such because uh, they're a, a minority-owned business. So again, that's something you can consider. And even though their bid isn't the lowest, we believe that it is the lowest and the best. So it doesn't have to be the lowest number all the time. You can qualify that one best. So that's by statute. Um, you have to add it in here. Um, again, I don't think you do because the statutory provisions, which do outline how governmental entities will purchase, will control that. Is that one of those things that's small enough that we could just switch it from lowest responsible bidder to lowest best bidder without having to totally call it out? Yeah. Um, but again, I think there'll be an argument that any change like that would still have to be voter I think you're better off if that's the goal, which a lot of it is right now just leaving with statutory protection. So, because the statute says lowest and best. Mm -hmm. Neil, is responsible different than best? Because it says in here responsible. And to me, that always meant, because you know, I was involved in government contracting, that they had the capacity. You know, you'd see these situations where someone came in low but they didn't have the capacity to do the work. And that's what responsible meant to me. And I think it, that's what it does mean. So again, it's somebody that has the financial wherewithal to complete the task, or they have the insurance and there's a lot of things that right. require of our bidders. Bond and so on. And that sort of thing. So it gives us the authority to say, um, to, to make sure we include all those things, but that wouldn't necessarily include best. Okay. So again- Just two different things. Yeah, I, well, not necessarily, they're not necessarily mutually exclusive, but they're not necessarily inclusive. Either. So again, I, I, I'd make the argument that responsible bidder is talking about financial considerations like the ability to get insurance. Um, whereas, you know, again, lowest, in this instance, this gives you enough room to make sure you apply the statutory um, description, which is lowest and best. Well, just as an aside, that responsibility issue is the thing that kicks out a lot of minority contracting. It can, it can, but it Because can. of the bonding. My argument would be you could never, can't ever eliminate that. Right. You always have to have bonding, you always have to have insurance. Yeah. So again, in, in circumstances like that, you, you can't make allowances for that. But again, that's all been part of the decision making that, that the, whomever it is that in this instance the public works, whoever it is that's making the decision, would certainly consider that. And ultimately, it's the council that makes the final decision because these contracts ultimately come before. You. No contract is enforceable. In the council. Okay, my second question is, isn't 12.14 uh, redundant with the first part of uh, the first section? 12.4? Uh, one four. One, I have a section 12.1. No, uh, it's 14. 12. 14. 14. Oh, all the way down. Oh, I beg your pardon. Okay. Page 38. No. So we have simply put, no, probably want an explanation. So the, uh, we have spe special taxing districts that can exist within the city. Um, that can be things like a CID. Eric, how many do we have? So we have three, but those are statutory. I think they're not assessments. They're, the, they're not special tax bills. They're property tax bills authorized by the state. We have the ability, if we would decide to create a benefit district, so this could be something like TIF. It could be, you know, again, something like this that would be established by council. Uh, I thought we had some, one thing, not anymore, but we did. Okay, so again, this gives us the ability to create these special, special taxing districts to be approved by council. It goes hand in hand with something like the TIF Commission. So just, Neil, if I can, I can add a good example is there was an assessment added to property owners to bury the power lines through Old Webster. So that's why there's no Ameren poles going down Lockwood. All those lines were moved underground by special assessment when the city redid the Lockwood streetscape through the old Webster district. And that would be something we'd want to make sure we keep in charge. Um, what, another in 12.05 or 12.5, 
we have the public hearing mentioned, and it is mentioned in sections 2.7, 2.8, 5.10, 7, 2, a variety of places. Could we just have one place where it defines public hearing, which would also then perhaps deal with the question of whether things need to be posted in a paper or those kinds of things? Could there just be one that everything could refer to? Yes. So you could create a situation where you would simply say under this section, public hearings, C-section, whatever the difference is, and then make this apply to all things. Public hearing, though, is defined by the courts. So what is a public hearing and what is enough due process is dependent on a lot of things. And there's not one single formula that, uh, that works to everything. So when we're talking about public hearings, I would tell you that we could still create something like that, Matthew. We could still, you know, again, have a section that says public hearings should be, you know, conformance with section, whatever it is, where we would then apply to all these things and just keep cross-referencing those sections. Um, in the end, you're still going to have some fairly vague language that basically says, you know, we're going to give you public hearings as required by the courts, or, you know, we're not going to say it that way, but we're going to, we're going to give you a public hearing on this that, you know, will include notice to you of X number of days, that type of thing. The notice requirements do vary because in some instances, you know, so we can't necessarily accommodate everything in one. So for instance, on some of the planning and zoning things, we not only require a public notice that gets published, we also require that we go out and actually post on, on the properties a sign that says there's going to be a public hearing. And we do that within 185 feet of the property that's the affected property. That's not going to be the same thing that you're going to do when you're talking about you know, public hearings for, um, for for other things like public improvements. Um, so you'd have to be careful, but you could probably generate something that would say, do this. I don't think this generates enough language to really be problematic. You know, again, it says 30 days, uh, you're going to get you notice know, of not less than 10, uh, nor more than 30. Um, I don't think the language is all that burdensome. Could we narrow it down? Probably. I'd have to think about what that would look like because it's not always going to be the same in terms of notice and the notice requirements for every uh, department or organization. Okay. I agree, Matthew, that I like the idea of the cleanliness, but it doesn't seem worth it. <laughs> yeah, that I understand. That makes sense. Um, and one other, 12.10. Um, is that not true for all of these rules? I mean, doesn't the council probably, have all these probably, powers everywhere? Probably, but we're giving the uh, city manager the authority under public works to make this recommendation. So again, sort of like I just said, it's it, it, all of these things are tailored to fit everyone and everything. So here we're, we're ensuring that if this is under the category of public works, that the city manager has this particular authority uh, to make this recommendation. Um, I, pardon me? I'm sorry, public, I said public works, I meant public improvement. Because of the, the subject matter, so again, this is something that gets done with some frequency. You know, this can be everything from the purchase of machinery necessary to do whatever the public improvements is to, you know, the, the hiring of companies up to a certain level. Um, we want that under the category of public improvement. So yes, the city manager may have these powers elsewhere, but we do want to ensure that uh, he or she has the power under this particular subsection. But I thought that was the city manager's job was to do these things for everything. So, I mean, I think that's, you know, if they're managing the budget and what we're doing, then that's really the focus of their position. I agree. So with putting it in different sections, you know, I mean, it just, you know, it may not be worth dealing with, but it just seemed like that's what we have the city manager to do for everything. I, I agree, but under public improvements, we're specifically talking about public improvements. 
So again, the city manager has the power to, to do things under other departments um, and make recommendations under other departments. But again, part of the reason you're doing this for public improvements is because of the aspect of due process and the effect it has on people and the desire for transparency. So um, again, I think that this is not a redundancy. I think this is something that you want to specifically state and enumerate within the charter to ensure that it's known that the city manager has this power. Okay, thank you. Those are my 12, my questions. Those are all good questions. You have time. Go uh, is that something that uh, a city of this size would be capable of? My opinion is yes. So but it doesn't exist yet? Not directly. There are federal statutes that do control what we do. Um, and again, this is something that was a, a subject of a lot of conversation in the Douglas Hill development about what we would do in terms of, you know, ensuring that there was minority participation and what that looked like. So um, there are federal rules and regulations that, that would apply if federal money's in, okay? So what happens when it's only state money or when it's only city money? You know, again, is that something that we could adopt? We could. But not through the charter. Not through the charter. Okay. You do it through the minutes. Neil, if I may, just on that end, one issue we did address is you look later in the charter, there is a prohibition on rebating taxes in the charter, uh, which does get into the sense of you've paid us a tax and now we're going to rebate it to incentivize something. You know, what can we do with that? And that's, uh, there's no clear cut answer, right? And how that necessarily works in that situation. But there's an interplay between the, the question you're intending, Kyle, and what the uh, charter allows or prohibits in that place. I have to admit that is troubling language. When Eric and I first went over it, it was like, wait a minute, what? Now, again, are there arounds, end arounds that can be done? Yes. <laughs> are they done routinely? Yes. But again, it's the sort of thing where if you want to ensure that there is transparency, you want to make sure people understand what's going on. So, but it's been tested um, in some circumstances. Again, we don't call. So for instance, on a TIF, one of the questions that came up was on a TIF, does that work? Well, yes, because you're not, you're not rebating a tax. What you're doing is creating taxes in lieu of, and so of what we call pilots, right? Uh, payments in lieu of taxes. So it's not a tax, it's a payment in lieu of a tax. Do you get around those things that way? You do. So there are end arounds that have been established that people much smarter than I am have, have come up with, but create some issues. Anything else? Oh, what is the pleasure of the board? We're caught up um, on Joe's updated schedule and we're ahead on our old schedule. Should we um, go through the rest of our agenda and come back to charter review if we have time? I think, I think that makes sense. So we're not cramping all the other agenda items in in the last two minutes. Okay. All right. Okay, we'll come back to that if we have time. Um, so the next um, item is to discuss wards, term limits, public engagement, voting, and the use of subcommittees. And um, I definitely think we need at least two subcommittees for boards and for public engagement. And um, so I could take um, volunteers tonight. I can send out an email. Um, are there other subcommittees that people wanna talk about? I can send out an email and people can send me their preference of what they want to um, serve on. And I I really want to thank Joe and um, Melissa and um, Jennifer and John for their work on the compensation committee. So what's the pleasure of the board? 
Could you restate which subcommittees you thought we would need? Well, I definitely think we need one for awards and public engagement. Would um, that be one or would that be two separate ones? It would be separate. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. The other committee I had mentioned, I don't know if it needs to be committee, but last time, Matthew, you brought up having the shared word doc, which I think we still don't have. And I didn't know if that's another thing, if there's like group to like review some of that or not. I don't know where that stands. Yeah, I think Matthew's not shared that with us yet. He's been compiling comments as we go along and also had some questions uh, last meeting about Sunshine Law, and I think that needs to be worked out. But I I believe that could be worked out between Matthew and you, Neil. As yeah, and I'll, you. I'll talk uh, to Matthew about it. I am concerned about Sunshine and making sure that it's available. The other thing I'm concerned about is is the time element for staff to make sure that everything's getting collected. So uh, we need to look at all those things, but I'm happy to work with Matthew in, in terms of making sure that, you know, again, if we can do it, we can do it. So, okay. and it goes hand in hand with what I said to you before, and that is that utilize your time well. The only thing you can't do is vote in these things. But if there are, you know, suggestions, recommendations, and we're calling them suggestions and recommendations and simply forwarded them to everyone for consideration at the next meeting, and then at the next meeting, we actually take that document and say, here's what we're talking about. I think what you've done is kind of bootstrap it all into the meeting itself as preparation for the meeting rather than vote. Okay. okay. Um, Madam Chair, the, the, the only issue that, um, and we haven't gotten to it yet, but it's kind of near and dear to my heart, is the subject of um, how we referendums and recall and all that, and what the criteria is for that. And, you know, in my mind, it's too easy to do it. And I would want to take a look at that at the point we get to it. Yeah, uh, it's, it's a big issue and it's going to be a big issue statewide too. So, so I, I agree with you. Um, so, so keep in mind, just going forward, and I'll, I'll give you this information, referendum and initiative is a constitutional protection. Yeah. Now, what's not is the amount, the threshold that you have to get. That's where you see the variance. Well, that's my my thing, the, the threshold. I, I'm not suggest referendum and initiative and recall. Mm -hmm. Although I think as Laura, the mayor would tell you, Mayor Laura would tell you that if you study this in political science, political scientists tend to think all three of those are bad ideas, but um, they're there. But but the threshold for it is something that concerns me. I, I get it. And right now, as, as, as our chair noted, the state legislature, which of course is known for its thoughtfulness, is looking at, did I say that out loud? Is, uh, is looking at what those numbers might be. And they're looking at changes statutorily to what's there. Now that wouldn't necessarily mean a constitutional effect. They'd have to put that out to vote. But again, they don't always pay attention to what the voters have said either. So uh, what this is gonna mean and how this is ultimately gonna play, I don't know, but it's something we're talking about. It's a timely issue certainly right now. And I am paying attention to what's going on with those proposed changes in Jefferson City, so. Okay. So, Paul, would it be okay when we get to that discussion to see where we land, if we need to dig in deeper? Okay. All right. So, shall I send an email out to everybody and you can let me know what you want to sure. volunteer for? Okay, I'll do that. Uh, Madam Chair, are you going to look at how many members to a subcommittee or can divide that up somehow? Well, I guess we'll see. How many people? What would that up? have to be minimum or under four? Less than a quarter. Yeah. Yes. Less than four. a quarter. Four or less. Yeah. Four or less. Yeah. Yeah, right. Okay. Um, uh, Neil, can you talk to us about the process of submitting our amendments or? Proposal, proposed yes. amendments. Yes, so I think that rather, and I used a turn of phrase that perhaps works. Um, I, I don't think you need to worry about the ballot language. I think you just need to worry about making sure that you have a clear statement of your concept so that what it is that you're recommending 
is clearly set. If the council accepts and adopts the recommendation, we'll then work on the language from there. But I think a clear, concise, succinct statement of what it is you're trying to do is all we have to do. A lot of the ballot language and ultimately how it turns out becomes negotiation between myself and Eric Fay, the five at the Board of Election Commissioners, who's a great guy, really easy to work with. Um, I really like him. But they, they have all sorts of limitations that they try and place on us. What this is going to look like, the magnitude of it, that's something I don't think you all need to worry about. I think what you need to worry about is just making a clear statement of what your recommendation is. So I would say, you want to separate them out. You want to mix your ideas. You want to make sure that, you know, again, just, just a single topic per recommendation that is clearly stated is the key. And I'm happy to help with uh, the construction of that language, whatever it might be. And then you all vote on those things. Give that to council. Council accepts it. Then we'll worry about what the structure is for the ballot. Because we'd be stuck forever trying to figure out the ballot. I think I suggested corseting ballot. Yeah, yes. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> uh, good question. Just point of clarification. So the proposals we come together, and we, you know, we've kind of gone back and forth on this on this compensation question, and and again, how far do we need to go in terms of providing the guidance of how we want that legal language to look? Not the ballot language, maybe, but at least the lead, the, the charter language. I mean, are we trying to write for the charter language or something less than? So I think you're trying to write for the charter language again. So ultimately, what you're trying to do to say, this is the change I think we need to make. Here's what it ought to say, yep. okay? And that becomes your recommendation. So if you were talking about compensation, you would say, I think that you know a council member gets X amount um, and, and that uh, he or she would, would get for their term. Um, you know, I don't think that, I don't think that's gonna be complicated. I just think you wanna make it clear what it is your state. Yeah, thank you. Can I ask you? Yeah, go ahead. So the ballot language, let's say we came to a recommendation that we wanted, you know, 30 wards and we want to pay you guys a million dollars each. Would those be two individual questions on the ballot or would it be a group of questions and you have to? Each one is a yes or a no. Okay. Each one. And again, that's that's why I'm saying the economy of, of what you're doing and how you're trying to do it is very, very important. Mm -hmm. And every time you put one on, it's going to have a cost. So, you know, again, it becomes a situation where this is maybe our top tier. This is the top five things we think are important. And then we have the next 10, then we have the next 15, whatever, whatever that might be. Um, you know, and they don't have to all be submitted at the same time, but you want to be careful about voter fatigue too, right? And frankly, if you give something that has, you know, 30 different proposals, um, are you really going to get folk reading those? And I think that's a risk because I think the charter is a remarkably and extraordinarily important document. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people don't realize it until all of a sudden somebody's tested it. And then you realize just how important it becomes. So it, it doesn't matter if it's in the same article or, or not. It's each individual. That, yes. Oh. Ultimately, if it's in the same article, okay. we would say we're changing the article to read from this to this. So could you put a whole article in? Yes, but now you're going to get into an argument with the Board of Election Commissioner who wants you to narrow your rules. Now, there's nothing in the statutes that say you have to do that. It becomes a negotiation. But again, I think we want to be careful about what that looks like. Okay? But don't, don't stress on that. That's something that if council says after your recommendations, yes, we think that's good, then we'll get into that. Thank you. Madam Chair, if I could follow yeah. up for just a minute. Um, you know, council has asked you to go through the entire document and make recommendations. Please don't select some out because you think they're not important unless you really believe they're not important. Um, we would like, and I think we've made it pretty clear, some prioritization of your list. But if your list turns out to be 30 and you tell us these are the top five things, you're doing exactly what we ask. So please don't worry too much about what is, um, what should be on the list, please do worry a lot about what you think are the most important things on the list. Any other discussion? No. Okay, thank you, Neil. Mm -hmm. um, 
see. We'll move on to old business. And um, Joe, do you want to give your update on your committee? Yes, I think the compensation subcommittee is ready to report. Uh, <laughs> and uh, once again, thank you <laughs> thank very you. much. You did a great job. I can't remember, was it, was that included in the packet or not? No? Yeah. Oh, it was. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I do have copies here, folks need it or anything to, in terms of our proposal. I'll pass that along. I'll do kind of a quick uh, summary of what our recommendations are and then our other subcommittee members that are here, Jennifer and John can chime in. Um, after looking through the current language and what other municipalities are doing in the St. Louis County area, um, we, we agreed very quickly that, that it was time has come to uh, look at a different approach and to modernize the compensation approach for the council members and the mayor. Um, and what we are proposing, um, if you remember, the current language is that members are reimbursed uh, $20 uh, for each regular meeting up to a cap of $600 in 12 months. The mayor receives $25 for each meeting attended, not exceeding $750 in 12 months. And from our understanding and looking at what other municipalities are doing in St. Louis County, this is the lowest uh, level of, of any of the other municipalities and dates back to 1965. Um, I know the issue has come up before with in prior uh, charter review um, uh, activities, uh, and, and council has decided uh, at least the last time that came up to to not put forward the proposal. But I we we believe it's time to do that, and so what we're suggesting here is a transition of the council uh, pay approach, council and mayor pay approach from the per meeting basis to a flat monthly approach, which is what most, or at least the, from our understanding, the vast majority of municipalities are doing that to provide compensation to their members on the, on the uh, part-time basis. And that we are using a compensation approach uh, based on what the city of Creep Core has set. Uh, so that's the the numbers are based on that. And on the flip side of the document, you'll see our comparison, uh, which I know uh, I believe uh, Mayor Arnold provided provided that at least the background information, and we kind of filled out a couple other things on that. Uh, so we look at that. Uh, other members of our committee also felt it's important that the uh, council review this periodically, and so we do have a, a language that would uh, require the city council to review this every four years, and we would give authority to the city council to set future compensation by ordinance. So this would not be locked in necessarily. It could go up or down, whatever future councils decide to do. Um, there will, will need to be provisions made for the compensation approach to be kind of phased in, uh, in accordance with uh, the current terms of the members. So uh, no current members uh, during the current term, no current mayor or, or city council members can receive that pay increase during the current term. It would go into effect with the new term for each of that. And because we do have staggered city council members, that would re mean that there would be a staggering of that implementation. So there will be a period of, I guess, two years where Three members will be receiving the per meeting basis, and then three members will go toward the monthly approach before that is all then harmonized uh, after a period of time. So I that's a quick summary. I don't know, Jennifer or John, if you have any other comments. Well, like we said, this is you know, this is going back from 1965. So based on some of our rate of inflation is where we came up with some of these numbers. Then we took that and compared it to the uh, neighboring cities. So I, I firmly believe the, these numbers are very, very reasonable and realistic uh, for what we feel they should be compensated for. 
you know, we, we need to show that we appreciate it and, and, you know, put a little bit of money to their, to the value of their commitment to this city. And one thing we need to make clear is when the next election cycle takes place, this or this review will take effect after the voters approve it. So the the three people coming up on the April of 2024 will have to be to the old pay because it won't be approved. You know, this takes effect after the voters have to approve it. Is that correct, Neil? Yes. So, Eric, can you Council members get as well as get a W-2 or a 1099 for their attendance fees? Uh, council members uh, do get a W-2. So we are paying in on those FICA taxes and such like that, just by way of the meeting, per meeting cost and such. Council members are paid quarterly currently. So we, we calculate that, their attendance and such, and those uh, things and pay it out quarterly under the current system, which your provision could change, may not. I mean, the, the actual schedule of the payments, that's an internal matter we can schedule regardless of the charter, unless the charter dictates it at a certain time. So attendance fees, it's my understanding that an attendance fee is something that would get 1099 versus a W-2. But I, it's been a little while since I've looked at that. So that very well may be, I think, I don't, I won't speak for past administrations or why that's the process that's been here since, since I have been here that we have included Medicare, FICA, and obviously um, tax it withholdings for any of that. Got it. I, and again, I bring that up because the charter says attendance fees, right? And I think attendance fees probably should be treated differently. Now, again, it's not a problem that we're doing it differently. It just does bring us into the range of compensation. And so I would have said, let's talk about that because there, there can be tax implications on attendance fees versus compensation. So if we call it compensation, and this is no argument about the money at all. I, I think you're right. I think it needs to be updated and I think it should be regularly changed. But I'm also general counsel for Lincoln County. And I had this issue come up because Lincoln County went from a second class county to a first class county. And when it did that, it had an obligation to increase the pay of its commissioners. And the question that was then raised was, can you raise the, the pay of a commissioner during their term? And the answer is you can't reduce it, but you can't increase it. You can increase it, okay? So I'm not trying to change what you're doing. I just want to make sure you understand that because a lot of people think you can't change it during the term. You can't. I can increase it. Mm -hmm. The problem with only increasing it incrementally is that you're essentially creating classes of council members, right? You're getting some council members that are getting X and some council members that are getting Y, some council members that are getting Z, at least in theory, which you've implemented what it's going on here. Um, and that may be what you want to do, but you can also provide that in the event that it does increase the first time, every time it, you know, it increases, it would apply to everybody across the board, even during their term. And you're not stepping on any constitutional toes. Right? I don't think our concern was the constitution. I think it was that the council wouldn't vote, be comfortable voting for their immediate. Right. Rights. Congress does it. <laughs> yeah. The state legislature does it. Congress is in effect until the next Congress. But they still do it during, and they, they vote for it. So right. again, and you can do it during the term. So again, I only throw that out there because I mean, ultimately they're gonna have to vote on it anyway, right? But then they're voting for whoever gets elected next rather than voting for themselves. In the next election cycle. But, but our issue here is that we got, you got three city council members that are on the staggered. So uh, in order to get the change in it, you know, in process, you got to start somewhere. Right, um, I agree. And I'm, yeah, not, I'm yeah. not arguing with you. I just want to make sure you understood yeah. those. So I'm not saying yes or, or saying no, I'm just throwing out there yeah. that there is that little bit of confusion that people think are out there. I can't change it during the course. And, and the answer is you can. Mm. Otherwise, you are creating these classes. Yeah. So. Just to follow up, uh, uh, at least our purpose here with it, and I think hopefully the chair agrees with the purpose, is, is to put this proposal in front of the full board, think about it. You know, uh, it, this is not necessarily perfect. It may not be the final approach that we use, but at least it's our starting point, what we think is workable. And, and if council and, and other staff or, or the mayor or city council members have some other comments they want to make about this. We can, we can certainly take that in consideration. Either as the full board, or if it gets um, 
involved enough, then we could go back into subcommittee if we have to and, and reconsider anything. Uh, you know, the, obviously the compensation levels is a bit of an arbitrary um, decision, a subjective decision at least. As John pointed out, you know, we're kind of trying to take into account, you know, uh, cost of living and the, the dirt and the, and, and the uh, time frames that we're dealing with and the amount of work that folks are dealing with uh, and to provide a, a just compensation, equitable compensation for members. Uh, but we realize this, you know, obviously there's a little bit of political fraughtness with all this kind of stuff and uh, try to do it in a way that makes sense that, that the uh, council and, and the voters can approve. And I think this will obviously be a, a topic uh, recommendation section that needs to be part of public engagement and see how, you know, if we get feedback and, and maybe we can fine tune from there. So just how you've written this would be how I would recommend you submit because I think it is clear and concise and none of this gives me any heart. I'm just talking about mechanically how we would do these things. So again, th th this is this is a format that I would recommend. you use. Yeah. I have a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. um, the table is really helpful for sort of being able to see how other communities are are compensating other councils. Um, do you have an idea of when? theirs were last reviewed, you know, um, like for example, uh, Creek Core is very similar to what we proposed, but um, was theirs done 30 years ago? Like ours was done 70 years ago. You know, was theirs done more recently? The, the numbers listed here, uh, and, and I know the mayor did the original research here, I double checked things. These are the current uh, data points. Right, but you what know. is like, say for example, Creek Core, when was the last time they reviewed it and updated it? Or is, has it been, you know, like adjusting with inflation? Like, you know, no, it's at least, I, I we'd have to go back to each one. I, I, I don't remember these off the top of my head, but uh, usually it's, it's being put into place by either their charter language. Uh, uh, mo many of them are using ordinance, which is kind of more complicated to find the information with, without calling <laughs> and, and, and asking each you know, municipality. We do have the answer to that, though. Creve Corps, they, they set this in 09, 600 and 400. Okay, so yeah, it's been quite a while on that yeah. as well. But yeah, the, the, the data point of, I mean, the, the changes in the data points vary among the municipalities. Um, if that would be useful for the members, I mean, we can go back and try to dig that up. As an example, they started at 200 for the mayor in 81, and then they've updated it, I don't know how many times, and in 09, it's now 600. So, uh, Neil, the proposed uh, numbers uh, from this committee, is that in line with what you saw from the county? It, it, they actually pay more. Um, they actually pay more. Um, I think it's twelve hundred a month. No, it's it's thousand. Um, in my fire protection districts, which are boards that meet similarly to council, they pay. Um, and they're set by statute, completely by statute. The statutes are fairly old, but their their um, maximum pay is 10,000 for board members and 12,000 for the chair. The chair gets paid more. So again, I think these are modest by comparison, but you know, again, those, those numbers are out there. I just wanna be sure if we're gonna like try to come to a modern number that we get all the way there and then adjust with inflation or however we want to suggest the council does. Yeah, yeah. And again, um we, we did try to take that in, in consideration uh, during our discussions or two meetings and kind of talk that through. Um I mean I, I mean obviously if you look on the, the comparison levels, Creep Creep Core is is a little bit above the average uh, of at least among the ones we've looked at. Okay. So um, um We've, we're trying to do it in that way. And then we also, you know, looking at this issue of um, that the council uh, would have authority to 
to revisit the issue every four years and, and at least I mean, even mandate that is what we're suggesting so that it could be brought back up uh, and, and adjusted, you know, based on, you know, whatever the cost of living issues are, or, or even if, you know, the city had, you know, dire financial problems and there's a decision made to go the other way for some reason. One advantage you have with this proposal is that whatever the threshold you set, they have the opportunity to change it you know, at least every four years. Yeah. So yeah. it gives them a chance to move it if they elect to do that. So right. giving them a mechanism to change. And would they only have the opportunity to do that on the four-year intervals, or could they change it at any time? I thought it was written so it could be any time, but I don't. I'd have to go back and read, read what the final one was because we went back and forth on that. Yeah, uh, we were trying to do a minute at least every four years. We said at least every four okay. years, and if we if we didn't write it that way, we should. <laughs> it says every four years. Good news yeah, is you still can. Do you have any idea of what the average um, time commitment is monthly for town commissioners? Yes, I had the notes there, but you probably can say it better. <laughs> So two things. One is you think about the times you spend in meetings. Every council member has at least two regular meetings with work sessions every month. We have averaged, I would say, a special meeting at least every other month for the last 18 months or so. So you're talking about um, that meeting time plus every council member is a liaison to at least two boards and commissions which have monthly meetings. And then you're talking about preparation time of several hours for every one of those meetings, plus any additional time you spend corresponding with residents, meeting residents, and things like that. To give you a number, right now I probably spend somewhere between 25 and 30 hours a week on my job. I will uh, probably be able to work that down once I've done it a little longer, but I don't envision a world in which I would spend less than 20 hours a week council members probably depending on you know who they are and what they're most interested in could end up spending that much time as well one detail that we were also given by mayor arnold was the sheer number of pages of documents which you said was like 100 or something uh, so our council packets i think the largest that i've ever had is 800 pages and we very rarely have anything that's less than 75 pages that was helpful to me to get a scope. Uh, Dr. Keeble, is there any, um, so if we were to consider something more along the lines of what they were doing in Lincoln, is it Lincoln County? Um, is there, uh, is that a strain budget wide? You know, like should we take anything into consideration? I, I appreciate the question if I pause to think about it, but no, I think the recommendation should be based on what market is, if you will, rather than what city finances will look like five years out, 10 years out. I, I think future councils could address it at that time if needed, but it's certainly, I liked your comment about if we're going to do it, it should be at what the accurate rate is. Thank you. I don't have the numbers in front of me. I need to figure out where I put them, but we did a very rough calculation and this is nothing in the budget. Like. The, no matter what number we go to out of any of these numbers, it's like such a small percentage of the budget. When you stop and think about the overall picture, it's not a big chunk. So when you look individually, you're like, oh, this is so much money. And then compared to everything else, it's nothing. Not nothing, but I mean, <laughs> but it's a, it's a small portion. It's not a big, not a, a factor in your decision. Yeah, I just, I think we do need just to be mindful of, you know, uh, the taxpayer interest and and keep that in mind, but as well as looking at you know what is a fair and equitable treatment of the time and energy and the due diligence we are asking our uh, office holders to put into you know stewarding our resources in our community. So that's kind of where we're trying to do the balancing act. You know whether the dollar amounts that we have in in this you know subcommittee proposal is what you we want to do as a board if we want to raise or or you know, even lower i mean we're happy to kind of think that process through and and then and perhaps it is you know through the public engagement process kind of test the reaction uh to uh you know doing this kind of a change go that route one of the things that keeps 
coming back into my mind, and I think it was Melissa that mentioned this at one of our first meetings was, you know, like we do want a more broad um, participation by folks of our community and, you know, like parents with young children, things like that. It could become an issue of, you know, like having uh, Be, being able to afford babysitters. Yes. Right. Yes. There's a lot of expenses that go into participating in our community. And, you know, so. Yeah, I would be in favor of looking at a higher compensation level, I think, than what the committee proposed. Mostly also knowing that before the level that saw in there was from 2009. Mm -hmm. I think that one's probably quite outdated as well. Anything else? I have a question that's coming purely from a place of ignorance. 25 to 30 hours a week, you're getting paid on W-2s. Why are you not an employee? And if so, is there like, <laughs> at what point do they just get benefits? Do they get, they're paying into FICA and Medicare? What's the distinction there that allows them to not have to do any of that? So we're in the charter, we call it attendance fees, which is why we're avoiding that question, which is why I raised that question. Because there can be, if you're an employee, there are certain things that ultimately are triggered, not by your hours, but by your pay. Now we're paying them such a negligible amount that those those triggers haven't occurred. But it's so, right. But we don't mm -hmm. think about you for the purposes yeah. of FLSA. We don't think about oh, you yeah, for yeah. the purposes of, of of workers' compensation. All of those sorts of things. And so uh, we don't think about you for healthcare purposes or vacation or any of that sort of thing. <laughs> Well, so <laughs> not that you're in well, that's why they call them attendance fees, so that we don't have to think about those sorts of things. But again, it's 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 an issue, Kyle. And so I think we would want to be careful. That would be a place where I'd have to do some wordsmithing to make sure that we didn't trigger um, something that we didn't intend. And it's not like a dollar amount that tr is that trigger. It's how it's worded as an attendance fee. It, it yes, it can be both. So we really want to be careful. But this dollar amount doesn't trigger that. So. Kyle, if I can also just add, having done this in a couple different places, so elected officials, while the mayor's right, our elected officials are very good and put in a lot of hours. There's nothing that says they have to, right? I mean, you can show up for an hour meeting twice a month and do the same as someone who works 35 hours a week at the job. So there is no timekeeping. There is no sick days. I mean, it's all, um, you as an elected official, you are not part of the oversight administration, you know, that we have over employees and such like that. You're accountable only to the, the citizens and the fellow council members. So there's a there's a different strata there. Um, and as Neil points out, um, the IRS looks a little differently at times and things with elected officials, right? I mean, what is their hours, their jobs? I mean, we all know uh, the chair could talk about getting the grocery store conversations on Sunday nights, you know, when you're an elected official and that, that um, they work a lot of hours, but they don't have to. We did specifically try to move away from the attendance fee because we know there's a lot more than the attendance, but I see your point as well. But I think you can get to the same end and still call them attendance fees by saying, you know, the attendance fees for a particular month would be without necessarily requiring a calculation, which would still put them in this category, then wouldn't trigger all of these yeah. benefits. As long as it's still monthly pay, then yeah. I, yeah, I get it. No, I understand your intent yeah. purpose. Right? And I think we can get it. That's what I'm saying. None of this gives me any heart, heartburn at all. I just want to make sure that I'm understanding. Yeah. Well, in, in our research, we, we um, at least in my research, uh, it seemed like most municipalities have moved to a monthly approach as opposed to meeting basis. And they have language around their charters or that help, you know, delineate that. So we can double check that on the language and all that. We need to. I have a question. This may be too complicated, so feel free to undo it, but kind of related to what you're saying, Tammy. We wrote this trying to think about how it would be perceived by the public and how we would argue it to the public. So we deliberately didn't go as high as we might like. We were trying to be reasonable. But this is making me think, and I don't know if I'm just missing this or somehow tonight is when it's hit me, talking about taking it to the council. We're also talking about public comment. So the idea is that we come to an agreement we do public comment and then it goes to council, right? But I mean, in my mind, it could also be with unlimited resources and time, right? There could be multiple steps there. But the idea is it's us, then feedback from people and then council, because it could, again, it could go either way. It, it, it's your call. Okay. Well, certainly you can make adjustments after you've heard public comment. Right. 
but I mean, it could be the other way. It could be that we give it to council and council says, I like these five. And those are the ones we get the feedback on. So that's just where my brain was trying to sort out which, which order they all go in. But it, it, even if we turn this over to council, they're going to do public engagement at some point, I believe. So there's multiple steps. Okay, thanks again. I wanted to thank this committee for their excellent work. Yeah, they did a great job. Very thorough. Very helpful. Yeah. Um, Matthew, can you fold this into your document somehow? The sending one? There you go. Yes, um, I can. I don't have a copy of it. I asked, I, I will, if Joe will send me one. I will uh, put it in. Yes, we will do so. Thank you. Uh, it's not the actual legal language. It's kind of a summary, but Absolutely. you'll have the, the gist of it. Yep. All right. Yep. Okay, thank you. Well, I lost my agenda. Great choice voting. Next yeah. was the voting. Yeah. Great choice voting. All right. Wait, wait, wait. Okay. Um, Dr. Peoples, did you have a chance to get any information on voting? I did. Thank you, Madam Chair. And actually, I need to give credit to Katie Nakazono. She uh, oh. did quite a bit of research on this. And so Neil is going to share with you. So um, Eric Fai, who is the... Um, General County, the Democratic General Counsel for, so there's a Republican in effect, who speaks to the Board of Election Commissioners, um, who sent a response to Katie's request um, regarding changing the dates for elections and regarding um, ranked voting. So, which do you want to take first, Madam Chair? Um, uh, ranked voting. So rank voting is not done in Missouri. It doesn't mean it's necessarily prohibited, but there's no place where it is done. Um, <clears throat> part of the reason I'm, I'm, I'm sure is because statutorily it, it, it's, it's a little unclear as to how it works. Um, you know, I know how they work and, and there is a trend towards it currently nationally, but there's at least right now, no provision under Missouri law that says we can do ranked voting. So you all know what ranked voting is. Anybody have a question about how that works? Okay, everybody knows what that is. So again, right now, I, I think we have to have statutory authority for it. Eric sort of spoke to that and said, we don't have it. Doesn't mean you can't, it's just, it's never been tri uh, tried and, and tested. Being the Petri dish for that sort of thing is gonna get challenged. It's going to engender litigation. Somebody's not gonna like it. Um, somebody's gonna challenge it. There are people who don't like that sort of thing. Um, you know, is that a reason not to do it perhaps? Just make you aware of it. There is no structure for it right now in Missouri. And I would tell you that's probably not a good place to be if we're heading down that path. I know there's a petition being circulated or ready to circulate statewide for ranked voting, but yeah, you know, it's a long way off. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I meant to look this up after our last meeting and I forgot. I thought they did something along the ranking in the city with the last. Yes. Election. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Right yeah. off. There is a form of ranked voting in the city, in at least primary, but I'm not. Yeah. I'm not an expert in this area. But yeah, it's it's approval voting. Yeah. Approval, approval vote. Approval yeah, voting. So, I think the city went to a system instead of a Democrat running against a Republican, the two highest vote getters would run against each other in the general election. Yeah. Yes. Non nonpartisan. Something. Yeah. Hmm. I think the spirit of our question was, since we're just one municipality bound by the election authority for the whole county, it's not the same as the city because they run their own election authority. So it, it's the same rules for the whole city. So did he? So his answer to the question isn't anything having to do with the St. Louis County Election Board. It's the state of Missouri does it. Right, state of Missouri. He was looking at it from a broader sense. And if, if, I, if you'd like, I'll read it to you. Um, sorry. You may have it. It's fairly short.
uh, RSMO 115.12, uh, that's, uh, his answer was, I'm not sure if a charter city can legally choose to elect its leaders through a ranked choice voting. Currently, there aren't any cities in Missouri that utilize RCV, but there are a number of charter cities that have utilized alternative election systems. St. Louis utilizes approval voting for the Board of Aldermen that hasn't been met with any legal challenge. I don't think there is anything in state law that would prohibit ranked voting, but this is something you will want an attorney to review on these things. So again, <laughs> I agree with Eric. I couldn't find any indications that this has been done anywhere else. Uh, the alternative election system that they have in the city, uh, which is the approval voting, um, you know, that's something that's out there. Um, but you're effectively ensuring that there's more than one election. And again, this is a decision for you all to make, but it's something to think about because it is a financial uh, uh, footnote to whatever we're talking about here, fiscal note to whatever we're talking about here. Because if you have more than one election, you're paying elections mm -hmm. twice. And elections are remarkably expensive. Eric, do you know what our last election cost? Uh, yeah. uh, I believe it was about, we had two questions. I think the last election was a two. It was 45 in that range for the two questions. Thousand. So thousand, your, thousand. your election becomes 90,000 if you're going to run two of them. We start. I thought there was an option to do it and not have to have multiple elections. I thought in the charter yeah, model, charter said that actually you eliminate yeah, we're only doing one. So I think that what Neil's talking about, approval voting, you're going to end up with potentially two rounds. Ranked choice voting, you could get oh, to one round. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so, yeah, that's what I missed. There's distinct voting systems. Right. So again, it's a bit of an uphill battle. It's not off the table necessarily. We just don't have any, any structure for it. It uh, doesn't mean we can't be creative and think of a structure for it. But again, there is a fiscal note. That you have to be aware of. If, if we are doing ranked vote, approval voting, you know, well, ranked voting might not generate two, approval voting might. It's just on that. Right. It's all on how you write it. But you'd have to be very careful to be very explicit in the charter that that was your intention. So, one of the questions that we had from that is. Is the election board capable of calculating those kinds of results? They, they clearly have not had experience with it, but does their software allow that? Are you an election denier? <laughs> <laughs> no. So, so the answer is yes, they, they can do that. I mean, they're in the business of counting these things and putting them in whatever structure they need to be put in. It would require some change on their part. They would have to do it. That doesn't mean it's not without cost, but I don't see anything that would prevent them from being able to do this. Right. Thank you. And again, I think Eric would have spoken to that. Um, he says, although we have not tested it, the election board does have software that would be able to program and tabulate the RCV elections. Okay. That was the question. I guess the other question was the change changing of election dates? So statutory provisions, and this is Eric's response, and then I'll give you mine. Uh, RSMO 115.121 states that all cities must hold their elections in April. But RSMO 115.123 seems to give charter cities some leeway in this regard. Other than Kansas City, I don't know of any charter cities, uh, any other cities in Missouri that hold their municipal elections on a date other than the April date. A few cities like St. Louis and Maplewood hold municipal primary elections, but the general election is still in April. So if you look at the statutory sections that Eric has cited, you can go to the Secretary of State's website. It has the 2023 municipal election calendar. In here, it has a provision for March the 7th, which can be a, a date that you would utilize, but you can only use that March date as a municipality if your charter provided for elections in March prior to, I think it was 1985. Then the next date is April 24th of 2023, which is a general municipal election day. So that's when they're structured, they're set up in, in the statutory provisions to um, hear these things and um, or to, to hold these elections. Um, underneath that, there's a statutory reference that again, cites the two sections, 121 and 123. The only way you get to a March date instead of your April date is if the charter provided for that quite some time ago. We don't do that, 
All right. So we don't have that, that date available to us. The only other date that you can then utilize if it's not that April date is if you have an emergency election of some sort. And again, in the absence of an emergency election, I think we are bound by 115-121, which says general municipal election day when held. The general election day shall be the first Tuesday after the first Monday in November for even numbered years. Two, primary election day shall be the first Tuesday after the first Monday in August of even numbered years. And number three, the election day for the election of political subdivision and special district officers shall be the first Tuesday after the first Monday in April in each year and shall be known as the general municipal election day. I think that's pretty clear. I think we got to do it. Can I ask a question? It's probably just a bunch of legal stuff that we don't have to go into, but I'm really confused. No matter what we change, because it wasn't changed prior to 85, you can't do it. That feels very odd. So it's not just me telling you. Yeah, I know if it's all bullshit legally, it's okay, but that just seems very Actually, strange. It wasn't 85, it was 99. Okay. Nothing in this section prohibits a charter city or a county from having its primary election in March if the charter provided for a March primary before August 28th, 1999. So forever, that can never be changed now. Unless the state changes. Well, yeah, they can change the statute. Okay, but nothing we can do. Okay. We've all learned that forever doesn't mean forever. So it's there. So 123 talks about public elections to be held on certain Tuesdays, and they talk about what you can do it for. But there's nothing in 123 that allows us to just change our general municipal elections at will. We're, I think we're tied into, under Section 121, that first Tuesday in April, no matter what. Unless it's an emergency. So under our referendum initiative situation, we have a situation where if there is a petition that has been approved by whatever the minimum 10% of the last votes for mayor um, in the mayoral race, uh, you can come in and you can, you can ask to overturn a um, decision by council you have to do that within 90 days. So under those circumstances, you could have a special election that ties into none of these days, although arguably because, you know, again, there's, there's an election date every quarter you can always plug in. The last thing in the world you ever want is a special election with only your governmental entity running the election because the cost of that is immensely prohibitive. Thank you very much. Manager. Just a friendly reminder that we do tonight have a seven o'clock hard stop because the plan commission has a meeting this evening as well. Okay, very good. Um, so agenda items for the next meeting, shall we ask Mara Perry to come speak with us? Another question too, if we're talking about like, I, I'm getting concerned about extending like, dates for public engagement because I'm sure schedules are starting to fill up at like Rec Center and things like that, especially going into the warmer months. Um, would uh, who would be the person in the city that we would coordinate with? Would that be any certain? In terms of setting dates and in terms of setting dates and understanding, you know, like what we need to keep in mind uh, on trying to put together the public engagement team. Uh, so I would be your contact, and it really depends on what this body determines public engagement is like, but if you use the rec center, so certainly if we need to do some room reservations, that sort of thing, we need to know in advance. Um, but public engagement is pretty wide open. There's a, a number of ways that you guys can do that, but I'll be your point of contact. Okay. I think you need yeah. to have I would like to, at the next meeting, set some initial dates for that. Maybe, uh, um, to set dates, I mean, we, in my mind, we have to know what we're going to present to the public before we set dates. I don't think there'll be problems getting places after people's to have public engagement. Um, if we do survey, that is something that could be sent out. Well, certainly. Absolutely. Staff will work with you. Um, um, it'd be my preference to firm up what we're actually going to present at a public um, meeting, but this is your committee. I'll do what you like. I mean, I think we can do both. We can be firming it up and looking at dates, because if we just wait, it's going to be hard to schedule. 
Yeah. And then, you know, as far as um, Joe's schedule, I think he has on there the time slot to consider. I yeah. If I, if I may, Madam Chair, real quick, uh, on the revised schedule sent around, um, I have attempted to condense and, and, and pull in more content uh, topics to, for meetings and you'll see where we're at at this point. Public engagement, I kind of, as Tammy sort of mentioned, April, May, kind of holding that as a placeholder to be looking at that time frame. And yes, uh, you are correct. We need to be thinking about, okay, what is that uh, both uh, going to take in terms of how we go about doing it and, and how many instances or format of that. Uh, to the chair's point, um, what, what is the content we're going to have people react to or to provide information? So, you know, we're just now starting to get through that process of having some specific proposals. Do we have enough yet? And, and are there still things that we want to have a discussion internally about here, such as the referendum aspect uh, that we need to decide that? And, and, is, and what is that package of topics that we want to bring forward? Um, so in the, in the matter of time, may we table the discussion of your updated timeline uh, to the next meeting? Is that okay with everybody? Yep. And then, uh, Madam Chair, I guess we, we also earlier talked about having public engagement as one of our committees. Right. Uh, and perhaps uh, members uh, that are interested in serving on that could uh, get together and kind of come together with a plan. Right. Right. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think it'd be awesome to get the committees going as soon as possible. Okay, so our next meeting date is um, February, no, February 15th, which is a Wednesday, uh, March 6th, uh, March 29th. And is there further member discussion questions? Seeing none, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? We're adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.